Our first lecture today is uh, Travis Knorr and Dr. Mick Walsh. Uh, Travis is a former aquarium fish collector in the Florida Keys, worked as the aquaculture lab technician at the College of the Florida Keys, where he also co-founded the CFK Aquaculture Club. In 2020, he became the curator and operations manager of the Key West Aquarium and then began work at Moats Elizabeth Moore International Center for Coral Reef Restoration and Research as the life support systems manager. Uh, Dr. Walsh uh, asked me not to read all of her stuff here, so we'll just say uh, she did graduate from Rutgers, and if you ask her, she'll give you the good Rutgers cheer. She did it earlier, and uh, now she works at the university as well. So I'll let them uh, go ahead and get started. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, early here on this beautiful Wisconsin Sunday morning. Um, I am Travis Knorr, and this is my partner, Mick Walsh. Um, Tim already explained a lot of this for you, so I'm going to buzz through this kind of fast so we can get going. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule because we thought we weren't going to make it here today because we were broke down in Tennessee for like three or four days, so we're here now. Um, okay, so we're going to present our, our uh, talk, Garage Culture, which is uh, about small-scale ornamental aquaculture. Um, I'll start out with the operational facets, and then Mick will elaborate on our personal engagement and community initiatives. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, see if I can find some stuff in here Tim didn't already explain. So I set up my first aquarium when I was about 10 years old uh, after being inspired by my father's piranha tank, which he would regularly bring home his uh, minnows from ice fishing and dump them in there. It was pretty exciting to watch and I just, I, I couldn't get away from aquarium keeping uh, from there. Uh, but it wasn't until about 2005 that I set up my very first fowler tank. Um, honestly, it wasn't very successful. I was a novice and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew that I was hooked and I knew I wanted to continue with aquarium keeping. Um, in about 2007, after discovering a scuba diver needed ad on Craigslist and a lot of snow flying and shoveling in Wisconsin, I decided to pack up my Dodge Omni and head for the Florida Keys. Uh, there, I got my professional start in the ornamental aquarium trade as a wild fish collector. After about four years of capturing aquarium fish, I felt like I had to do something more sustainable and productive for the aquarium industry and decided aquaculture was my next path. Um, I enrolled at the College of the Florida Keys where I received a degree in marine environmental technology with a certificate in tropical ornamental mariculture. Uh, after working as the college's science lab technician for a couple years, I accepted a job offer as the life support systems technician of the Key West Aquarium and sub subsequently became the operations manager. Uh, once again, feeling the need to be more proactive about preserving the amazing reefs of the Florida Keys, I accepted my current position at Moat Marine Lab. So I'm Mick Walsh, and uh, I'm currently an associate professor of marine science and aquaculture at the College of the Florida Keys. I've been there since uh, 2014. And I got my start in aquaculture working as a lab technician for NOAA's Northeast Fishery Science Center, uh, rearing uh, local fishery important marine species to examine environmental influences on growth, development, uh, morphology, and mortality of larvae and juveniles, which ultimately were contributing to the best scientific information available for use in fishery stock assessment assessments. And then my aquaculture experience broadened to focus on hatchery and release strategy for flatfish stock enhancement uh, as a graduate student both at the uh, University of New Hampshire here in the U.S. and then at Kyoto University uh, in Japan. And 2014, right, I moved down to Florida and my focus shifted to uh, culturing marine ornamentals. All right. So, before diving into your garage, there's a few realities you probably need to understand. Uh, there's a very common saying in aquaculture that maybe some of you have heard before. Um, do you know how to make a million in aquaculture? You start with two, right? So as a home aquaculturist, you'll likely not be able to afford or rely on help with building or maintaining your garage culture system. Um, so you're gonna need to have uh, skills to be able to do the majority of the work yourself. We wear many hats, some of which we make up as we go, uh, but others, we have to take the generous advice of those who came down this road before us. You'll need to know basic electrical, plumbing, carpentry, and engineering skills, uh, in addition to biology, husbandry, chemistry, marketing, packing, and shipping fish, among other things. This is not for the faint at heart, um, and once you back your car out of the garage and fill your tanks with fish, 
You'll need to understand that the rewards are more than just income. You're now supporting the hobby by doing something that you love. Our operation is Summerland Ocean Life, and it's located in the islands of the Florida Keys. Um, it's currently a lot warmer there than it is here today, but you know, we, I still love Wisconsin and I'm really happy to be here today. So um, Floridians who are raising aquatic species for commercial sale in the state of Florida must acquire an aquaculture certificate of registration from the, 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 Florida, uh, the Florida Department of Agriculture. Um, it's an annual fee of $100, so it's not so bad, um, but the certificate authorizes the production and sale of aquaculture products, not only in the state of Florida, but nationwide. Um, it identifies our products as cultured products, which uh, differentiates them from wild caught fish, which is a, a, a you know, large portion of the trade in Florida. Um, and it entitles us to the same benefits bestowed on other agriculture producers, including tax benefits. Um, it reduces the number of permits that we might need for our operation. Um, and Summerlin Ocean Life is also registered as an S Corp. So that works well for a small business like ours that doesn't have a lot of liabilities. Um, an S Corp uh, is usually an owner operator type of business uh, where the business income can pass through to the owners. Um, this means that the income is only taxed once, so it's, it's good for a setup like ours with a very small business. Um, however, there is no separation from the ownership of the business and the business's liabilities. So um, we work in our garage, we don't have a whole lot of risk, so that works well for us, but if we were to do like aquarium servicing in people's homes, um, there is some risk involved there. So an LLC is usually uh, a better choice for that, or some type of insurance, of course, to, to protect yourself from uh, you know, the unspeakable tragedies that could occur from an aquarium in a home. Um, so the location of an aquaculture facility is usually the first consideration in any system design. Summerland Ocean Life is in a very unique location. Uh, we're sited on a rural island in the lower Florida Keys. Um, I'm not sure if any of you all have been there before, but um, we're uh, the Florida Keys are located on the southern tip of the Florida Peninsula as it stretches westward into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there are about 100 miles of islands connected by bridges, with mile marker zero being downtown in Key West. Um, we're at about mile marker 27 and a half, so we're not too far from Key West, um, and the island that we're on is uh, called Ramrod Key. Uh, because of scarce property, a small footprint is much more feasible than a larger facility in our scenario. Uh, so we use the space that we had available to us, uh, which is the space underneath our stilted house. Uh, so the water source is your next major consideration for a project like this. Uh, the Florida Keys do have some areas of very high quality water. Um, however, we're located on a heavily trafficked canal. In fact, our house is located on the main canal in Ramrod Key, so we have a lot of boat traffic coming up and down the canal. Um, and while it may seem like we have a never-ending supply of seawater, uh, that seawater can be very risky to use. So um, aside from naturally occurring bacteria and protozoan pests, there's high levels of nutrients and the potential for chemicals or heavy metals from boats that are a cause for concern. Um, so therefore, we decided to do what probably most of y'all do. Uh, we use RO filtered tap water with a commonly available salt mix to create our system water. Right, before, before he moves on, I just, I'm pretty proud of this photo because if you look in the upper left-hand corner there, you'll see there's a, a manatee in our canal. And so that's like an extra special surprise when you get to see a manatee in the canal. Thank you. All right. Florida life. <laughs> um, so yeah, being in the Florida Keys, we don't have a lot of room. Um, and for this reason, our fish room is very small and it's very compact. Um, I decided to combine the broodstock, the nursery, and the grow-out systems into one decouplable system, um, a recirculating system. There are both advantages and disadvantages to combining all these systems together. Uh, the advantages include uh, it's less expensive, it's simpler to operate, um, and common water, uh, water chemistry among all parts of the system. Um, the big disadvantage is the inability to control or reduce nitrates in the larval and grow out systems. Typically, broodstock and grow out systems require heavy feeding. Uh, that causes elevated nitrates. Normally this is fine, but uh, has a, a, a negative impact on hatch rates uh, for developing larvae, which are very sensitive to high levels of nitrates. Um, here's our main broodstock system. Uh, up top, it contains two 75-gallon tanks, 
Um, and then in the middle row there, there's eight 10 gallon tanks uh, that were designed for clownfish, gobies, and dottybacks. Oh, let me step back. I forgot to mention the two tanks on the top, the 75s. You can just barely see on the image on the left, there's uh, jawfish. So that, those were actually set up to culture jawfish with a deep sand bed. Um, the very bottom row is the sump, consisting of three 75 gallon, very low profile tanks. All these tanks were built in house by us out of acrylic. Um, this was to maximize the amount of tank space for the limited footprint of our fish room. Uh, here's an image of our molar system, which stands for Modular Larval Rearing System. Uh, the system was based on designs uh, created by Dr. Andrew Ryan. He was here yesterday. I didn't see him this morning, um, but he can explain more of this in detail if you've got questions about it. Um, these tanks are, are where the physical hatching of the eggs occurs. Each tank's water comes from the main system and can be manipulated uh, with controllable flow rates, temperatures, and standpipe screen sizes. Uh, we run our tanks still during the actual hatching and then slowly increase water flow as uh, the larvae develop in the tanks. Um, and again, the water does come from the main broodstock system, so it's uh, therefore identical in water quality parameters. So when we're transferring eggs, they're hatching out in the same exact water that they were developed in. Um, this does, however, mean that we run the risk of elevated nitrates in those hatch, hatch tanks. Um, this has happened um, and can cause, cause larval die-off, um, poor hatch rates, and even slow or abnormal larval development. Um, if you ever see clownfish with flared gills and stuff like that, that's likely uh, due to high nitrates or poor water quality. Um, so as the larvae grow, we exchange the standpipe screen with a larger and larger mesh size. Um, the tanks can be removed from the system for thorough cleaning and sterilization between hatches. You can see Mick on the left-hand side holding one of the tanks up with the standpipe in it. Um, and you can also see that we painted the bottoms white so that you can see the larvae uh, when they're swimming in the water. Um, to clean them, we use Alkanox, which is a, a lab, lab uh, wear cleaner, followed by a diluted bleach solution to thoroughly sterilize them. Um, the tanks themselves, uh, they were 55 gallon pickle barrels, right? So uh, we found the tanks on Facebook Marketplace. They were really cheap. Um, th this is a, a fairly unique shape for a, a 55 gallon drum. Um, called a pickle barrel. They're usually used for um, food grade stuff. These were um, actually used for chai tea, so they smelled kind of nice when we got them. Um, but at any rate, uh, never pick something that was used for oil or any sort of uh, cleaner or non-food grade substance. Um, I definitely suggest that you stick with something that um, is, is you know, gonna be safe for your fish. Uh, the interior is very smooth. Um, and there's a tapered bottom, which uh, makes it uh, a really a, a great shape, uh, especially compared to a flat bottom barrel. Uh, water just moves a little bit better with that tapered shape. I cut them slightly above the halfway mark, so each tank holds about 28 gallons, give or take. Um, and so far, they've been successful for all the stuff that we rear, including clownfish, dottybacks, gobies, and cardinal fish. Um, and again, because of limited space, we use our molars for the grow out of our fish. You know, we just don't have room to have additional tanks for all of the, the fish that we're raising out. Um, in this photo, you can see a mixed group from several hatches. Sometimes we'll put several tiles in the tank to hatch out. Um, also pictured, you can see the standpipe uh, screen. It's a, it's a standard screen. Um, and then there's some floating chain in there that provides like a three-dimensional structure for the fish. Uh, we also use short lengths of PVC pipe uh, and natural barnacles that you can find at a curio shop. Um, the dotty backs love the barnacles, um, but any structure at all can, can significantly reduce aggression as long as there's enough structure. If there's too little structure, then fish are going to try to um, defend that structure and actually increases uh, aggression. So there's definitely a sweet spot as far as how much uh, uh, material and structure you put in these tanks. Um, and because there's so much to do, it's important to automate as much of this as possible. Uh, here you can see what our automatic fish feeder refill day looks like. Um, we took some amazing advice from the Mazna 2021 Aquarius of the Year, Kathy Leahy. Hey, Kathy. <laughs> when she gave a, a talk, I'm sorry? 
Yeah, oh yeah, they, these were uh, a game changer for us. Uh, she gave a talk at the Marine Breeding Initiative Workshop in 2019, uh, where she explained how she manages to run her basement hatchery while still working full time. Um, these fish feeders pictured here operate unlike most common feeders you might have seen on the market. These feeders have partitions where specific amounts of feed can be placed into the wells. This allows the user to add exactly as much feed as you would like uh, to be fed out at each feeding occurrence. Um, the feeders can then dispense up to four times daily or as little as um, one, once a day, uh, allowing the feeder to last up to two weeks between refills. Um, very small feeds such as TDO's A1 can be dispensed by these feeders with fairly good accuracy and almost no worry of overfeeding, which is very important. Um, this was a game changer for us. We previously used barrel type feeders, uh, which are finicky and can overfeed or underfeed depending on how much feed is in the barrel and the size of the, uh, the pellets that you're putting in the, the barrel. Um, and of course, you know, working at the Key West Aquarium, I had to become familiar with some industry terminology. SCADA was one of the terms I actually did appreciate, system control and data acquisition. Of course, a lot of us have seen this, uh, this screen behind us here. Um, the SCADA system at the Key West Aquarium monitored saltwater production and injection wells. Um, that information had to be reported uh, for the permitting for, to the DEP. Um, of course, our home SCADA system is something uh, much more simple, much more user-friendly, and much cheaper. Um, this Neptune system is certainly a wonderful system that allows both monitoring and control. Um, there are other systems out there that work equally as well. Um, systems for commercial use, though, like I said, can get very, very expensive, so we appreciate the price point that um, some of these products are at. And, and all the stuff that they can do. But I will tell you what is more expensive is a failure that wipes out your grow out tanks or even worse, your brood stock. It's sad but true, these fish can be replaced, but best practices determine that it's our obligation to put forth valid effort uh, to prevent these terrible tragedies from occurring in the first place. So, um, you know, the loss of your spawning adults, uh, of course, can set an operation back months, if not a year or more, to reestablish productive fish. So it's very important that we do everything we can uh, to monitor and control our systems. Um, you know, having this techno technology will promote success, even if it's built over time. You can always build on these products and add features as you grow. Um, you know, here we are in Wisconsin. I'm not sure if a hurricane has ever gone this far north, but I can tell you from experience, uh, tornadoes certainly have. Um, in any case or location, you need to prepare for the worst case scenario, the unexpected. We rely on a military issue uh, diesel generator for backup electricity, uh, which is very important for us in our location. Um, some locations have LP or natural gas plumbed into the property. In those cases, a natural gas generator is a good choice because you'll never have to worry about old gas or running out of fuel. Um, and of course, you know we don't have that luxury, so we use this diesel generator. Diesel is a more energy dense fuel compared to other uh, ga you know, gasoline and propane, and therefore a, a tank of diesel will run longer uh, than the same or, or a similar size volume of uh, fuel tank of gasoline and especially propane. This generator, we bought it after Hurricane Irma, um, incredibly reliable and efficient. Um, it produces enough power, of course, to run our fish room as well as our home's air conditioner. And, and that's not just for us, you know, we need to be able to keep our fish room cool. Uh, powering the climate control, you know, should be considered in any case because most marine fish do not tolerate temperature variance at all. And so if you can't keep your fish room cool then, or, or warm for you guys, I suppose, um, it's, you know, it's pretty important that you're able to maintain your climate control. Um, so these are some of the species of fish that we culture. There are four species of clownfish, of which we have over 12 phenotypes, um, two species of gobies that are both local to the Florida Keys, and two species of dottybacks and uh, Bengay cardinal fish. Uh, in this image, you can see our algae culture room, which was converted from a bathroom. Uh, the tile floors and white painted hardy board walls are perfect for easy cleaning, uh, sterilization, and generally functioning as a clean room uh, where we can manage sterility of these cultures. Uh, to save on water and the cost of uh, fertilizer for the algae, we use system water and sterilize it using a name brand chlorine bleach at a concentration of 20 milliliters of 7.5% bleach to 20 liters of filtered seawater. And again, that filtered seawater is coming right from our system. 
Uh, the chlorine is allowed to disinfect the water for 24 hours. Um, longer than that seems to affect pH. There's some strange things going on, so 24 hours seems to be the mark that works really well for us. Um, the chlorinated water is then added to the sterilized glass jugs um, and then neutralized with sodium thiosulfate uh, stock solution that we prepare ahead of time. Um, we use the F over 2 fertilizer. Uh, the solutions are added at a concentration of uh, 2 milliliters of parts A and B per liter of total culture volume. Um, the smaller wine jugs in the picture are just shy of three liters, and those uh, fermentation carboys are 20 liters. Um, I use a common OTO pool test kit to test the chlorine level in, the, in the, the water to make sure that all that bleach is neutralized before inoculating the jugs with uh, the microalgae. Um, lighting, nothing special there. It's a combination of inexpensive DIY LED lights um, in you know, white, red, and blue with a common fluorescent fixture that I just had laying around. So you don't really need anything special for the lighting. Um, of course, you do need air. Uh, filtered air is pumped into these jugs, keeping the cells in suspension and also providing some CO2 to the cultures. Special shout out to my dad, Gene Walsh, and his love of Carlo Rossi Paisano wine uh, for donating the small wine jugs to our facility. Thank you. All right. Okay, so um, zooplankton, of course, you're gonna need to feed your larval fish. Uh, we keep monocultures of rotifers as well as polycultures of rotifers combined with Tigriapis copepods, um, also known as tigger pods in the aquarium trade. Um, all of these cultures are housed in used five gallon buckets, uh, same buckets that we receive our salt mix in. Um, the copepod noplii, uh, they're great to feed out. They're slightly smaller than our rotifers. Um, so when we strain our, our culture buckets, we're actually feeding out rotifers and copepod noplii to our larvae. Um, this allows us to feed, uh, to increase our food offerings, so a more diverse diet uh, for those larvae. Um, the adult tigger pods are also an excellent feed. We kind of feed them out as a treat, um, similar to baby brine shrimp. They're about the same size, um, and they have naturally high levels of astaxanthin, which is a, a carotenoid, um, which definitely helps with uh, larval development, so they're, they're super nutritious. They are a little bit crunchy, so um, they're not perfect, but they're, a, they're definitely a good feed. Uh, before feeding out, the rotifers are enriched. Um, many of you might be familiar with that uh, process. We just uh, soak them in a microalgae paste um, that gut loads them with essential fatty acids. That's all that nutrition that's taken up by the larvae then. Um, so getting into the fish, of course, clownfish, right? We, we culture clownfish. Um, they're the bread and butter. They're really easy to culture. Uh, they're one of the most traded uh, marine fish in the industry, so it, it makes perfect sense. Why wouldn't we, right? So uh, we, we raise several different types of ocellaris, uh, as well as perculas, maroons, and clarkies. Um, and, and of course, within the last 20 years, the selective breeding of designer clownfish has increased values and maintained market demand. So it definitely keeps interest on clownfish. Um, some of the types that we regularly produce are mocha vinci's, frostbites, snowflakes, darwins, onyx, uh, picassos, lightnings, and galaxies. Um, and we're always looking for more fish. Um, clownfish, of course, are well suited for captive life. They don't require a lot of space. They tend to do just fine in smaller, larger tanks. They also ship really easily. They don't have uh, fin rays that poke through bags, they just, they work really well. So, um, of course, they're in demand. Um, you know, of course, they, they have a large egg size that um, makes it easy for us. They have good hatch rates, readily accept rotifers. Again, it's just, they're really easy to culture and they make for a, a very good fish to, to learn uh, how to do these things with. Um, they lay their eggs right on a tile. We take the tile, transfer it into the, into the hatch tank. Um, and again, it's just, they're almost too easy. Uh, gobies, um, similar, a little bit more difficult, but a, a very similar culture method uh, to clownfish. We raise blue neon gobies and shark nose gobies. Uh, these gobies are known as cleaner fish and provide an ecological service to other reef fishes. So their abundance on, on the reef and their natural habitat is important for overall ecosystem health. Um, so if we can culture these gobies and offset the need for wild collection, uh, then it's important. We ought to be doing it. Uh, both of these species are local to the Florida Keys. The blue neon gobies can be found in uh, shallow depths uh, as, as little as five feet down to 80 feet or more. Uh, the shark nose gobies seem to prefer uh, deeper depths and uh, can often be found in barrel sponges. Gobies, uh, like clownfish, they're demersal spawners, meaning they put their eggs right on a substrate for you. 
Um, and uh, you know, they're simple, they're easy to produce, and uh, they do take a little bit longer to reach market size than the clownfish. So you're gonna spend a little bit more time before they are ready to sell. Um, they sell really well, especially to public aquariums. Uh, we have a good relationship with the Key West Aquarium. They buy most of our blue neon gobies, and they use it as a part of a natural parasite mitigation regime. Um, and of course, with the increasing demand uh, or trend in nanotanks, uh, these neon gobies are a small fish and appropriate for nanotanks. So we're, we're seeing the, uh, a, you know, demand for the blue neon gobies uh, and shark nose gobies increase as more and more people are getting into nanotanks. Uh, dotty backs, so we also culture orchid and neon dotty backs. A uh, little bit different than the others here. These fish produce an egg mass. In the image you can see on the left, there's an egg mass, and if you could look really close, you can see small dots in that tan mass, and those small uh, dark dots are actually their eyes developing. Um, on the right side uh, is a, a side view of our homemade egg tumbler. It's built from a very small funnel. Air is slowly bubbled up from the bottom, the narrow end of the funnel, at about one bubble per second. That just keeps that egg mass tumbling and turning so it doesn't rest on the bottom. Um, their larval stage is much longer than clownfish, uh, but once they're through metamorphosis, they start to grow really, really fast. Um, in general, dotty backs are extremely colorful. They're active. Um, in most cases, they're reef safe uh, and tend to sell really well. They're very attractive. Uh, metamorphosis, uh, I already said that. Metamorphosis does take longer compared to clownfish, uh, about six weeks for us. Our clownfish usually a little bit less than two weeks, sometimes as fast as one week. Um, so a little bit more time and culture before they can go out the door. The Bengay cardinal fish, right? So um, we love our Bengay cardinal fish. Uh, they are mouth brooders, which is of course super awesome to watch in your home aquarium. Um, from our experience, a simple 10 gallon tank usually isn't conducive to, to routine spawning. Our best successes uh, have been our pairs that are housed in our refugium and our frag tanks. Um, so that leads us to believe that um, an enriched environment is more, um, is a more, or a more natural setting, promotes active spawning. Um, and there appears to be many different techniques to spawning with various levels of success. We've been following a lot of other uh, breeders and it seems like nobody's doing it the same way. Everyone has their own technique. Um, unlike clownfish where, you know, 10 gallon tank, tile hut, flower pot, done, right? I mean, everybody does clownfish the same because it works really well. Um, you know, if, if um, as people learn, they share this information and, and we're definitely trying to find more ways to do this. And, and one of the techniques we've seen uh, is people actually pair swapping. They don't just keep a male and a female together. Um, they'll actually swap that male out because it's uh, the, the male holds those eggs and after they hatch for so long, he gets pretty exhausted and needs a break between the f before the female tries to put eggs in his mouth again. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and, and Ben guys, you know, from a conservation standpoint, it's very important that we're culturing them. Their native range, um, their populations are considered overfished. Uh, in fact, most Ben guys that do enter the trade from wild collection are collected from non-native populations that have been introduced to other locations. Uh, furthermore, their survival rate uh, one, after collection is typically very poor. Uh, so that makes aquaculture Ben guy cardinal fish a, a better option. Uh, you can just uh, ensure a higher rate of survivability. Um, and for these reasons, of course, Bengais should be a high priority for aquaculturists. The reality is, however, that due to their small clutch size, they are considered not economically feasible for production by some of the larger commercial breeders. Um, last night, if y'all heard Dr. Judy St. Ledger uh, talk about um, uh, the low price of fish, right? And, and I agree entirely. It's up to us to set that price point. Um, we, need to, we need to understand that these aquacultured specimens have a higher value, and we need to, to demand that higher value and, and present them as a, a higher value product. <clears throat> so you want to compete with the big boys. There are some strategies you have to consider as a small-scale operator. So Mick and I will never be at the volume of pro aquatics or ORA as much as we daydream about taking over the world, uh, in part because we both have full-time jobs, right? So we have to find advantages that we can capitalize on. Um, we sell locally. One of the most talented and knowledgeable local collectors sells most of our fish for us. Um, we just don't have the time to market directly to hobbyists. So we choose an outlet for our fish that makes sense and has an acceptable return. Um, he also comes right to our house and picks up his orders, saves us time, and um, you know, just makes life easy for us. <clears throat> you 
you know, and time, right? Time is all we have in this life. Yeah, sure, we love to spend time in our fish room, of course, but we also love the same things everybody else does, right? We like to go camping and hiking, fishing, I like to sail my Hobie cat, ride my mountain bike, you know, wrenching on cars in the driveway now. Um, but my point is that you need to find efficient ways to complete the daily fish room tasks, right? So use beakers, funnels, uh, sieves, and other labware that are, are conducive to the task. You know, have just dedicated tools for those tasks and an easy place to wash and store these tools. You know, we don't need to walk across an entire complex to feed our fish or mix salt or siphon tanks, and that's an advantage for us. You need to capitalize on those advantages and just make tasks easier and faster for you so you're not spending your entire life in the garage. <clears throat> Every fish that leaves our fish room, you know, this is important. You know, a small producer, you have a brand and you have to protect that brand. Um, and it's, it's so much easier for us at a smaller volume to ensure that every fish that leaves our fish room um, we're proud of, and it's perfect. It doesn't have flare gills or you know, deform, deformalities. So you have to protect your brand and your reputation because once it's lost, you're never gonna get it back. Um, so that's very important and, and something that's easier for us to control. Um, okay, so here's a, a set of images from our pack out day. This is what it looks like um, w before our, our buddy comes over to pick up fish. Uh, we, you know, we do this, the standard packing routine using oxygen, uh, fish bags, um, and our purchaser, you know, he benefits from the ability to add these in-demand uh, types of clownfish to his in-stock of, of locally caught Caribbean fish uh, and inverts, diversifying his offerings. So, uh, you know, and realize that the supply chain is short, so there isn't a wholesaler eating up our profits. You know, it's just, it's just us and our one distributor. Um, and so one trick I've learned that I'd like to share with you all uh, to save time um, is to take a photo of your fish and then take you know, your simple photo editing app and just click little dots on all the fish because I don't know if you've ever tried to count 100 fish swimming around in a bag. It's impossible. So um, yeah, this is just a little trick that I learned um, and it, it certainly helps save us time in the fish room. So as we indicated, uh, fostering that, that real local connection is, is an important priority for us. And so to that end, we support um, several community in initiatives, um, including Dive Into Life and Saltwater Superheroes. So Dive Into Life is an extracurricular science, technology, engineering, and math enrichment pro uh, program based in the lower Florida Keys. And it utilizes scuba diving and scientific research diving as the tools to attract and engage uh, teenagers and young adults um, to affect positive individual, social, civic, and environmental change. So I, I currently serve as the science director to this organization, and Summerlin Ocean Life supports them monetarily both directly um, as well as indirectly via Amazon Smile um, that donates a percentage of our, our business purchase costs um, from Amazon to them. And this year, we're actually, starting next week, uh, welcoming the Dive Into Lifers into our hatchery for aquaculture and aquatic animal husbandry training, uh, particularly on those days during hurricane season, uh, when the weather isn't uh, quite so amenable to scuba diving. Uh, Saltwater Superheroes is a program created by the Class 29 of the Leadership Monroe County, which is a respected organization whose sole mission uh, is to cultivate, educate, and empower local leaders in the Florida Keys. So the Saltwater Superheroes program is new. It started last year, and it's an environmental education opportunity for middle school students in the Florida Keys. Um, the goal is to expose Keys students to their local environment, therefore creating stewards of change and protecting our fragile um, Keys ecosystem. Um, most of us know down in the Keys that there is a big chunk of kids, that even though they grew up in the Florida Keys, um, they have never had the means to be out on a boat before. And so that was the mission, is to get these local kids out on a boat to see these ecosystems that surround where they live. And uh, Summerlin Ocean Life uh, supports this program at the ship level, meaning uh, we found about 14 to 18 local students to get out on the boat with a, a local non education nonprofit uh, every year. Trav and I are also very involved in our professional organizations and advisory committees. 
uh, where we collaborate on advancing uh, the science and uh, sustainable approaches of what we do with other leaders in our field. Uh, we've been members of MASNA since 2016. Uh, woo, we started the College of the Florida Keys uh, chapter of MASNA in uh, 2017. Uh, members also of FMAS, the Florida Marine Aquaculture Society, a little bit farther north of us, you know, in Miami, you know, north. Um, and uh, Travis, Lee, uh, Travis currently serves on the uh, MASNA Board of Directors. Uh, he is also uh, on the Marine Science Advisory Committee at the College of the Florida Keys. And me, uh, I'm currently on the Board of Directors for the U.S. Aquaculture Society, uh, and I am the immediate past president of the fish culture section of the uh, American Fisheries Society. And although we haven't really had that time yet, uh, that ever-coveted time um, to, to really dive in yet, we do have the infrastructure uh, to conduct research uh, on different live feeds especially, um, and, and we are really excited to try to crack some new species as well. Uh, aside from our marine fish aquaculture, uh, we also enjoy raising some freshwater tilapia and vegetables in our outdoor aquaponic system. And we have basil and green peppers and mint and tomatoes growing year round. And uh, every December, we invite our friends and neighbors over for an annual celebration or during our Fish Miss Fish Fry, and we use that opportunity to host uh, an open house of our Summerlin Ocean Life um, activities and facilities. In addition to fostering these local relationships, animal welfare is a really, really high priority for us. And at Summerlin Ocean Life, um, we implement best management practices that minimize stress of the animals in our care. At the college, I teach courses in aquaculture best management practices and diseases and parasites in marine aquaculture. And as a part of these courses, I have my students complete these free online self-paced animal welfare trainings. The Aquarium Vet's vision is to advance the health and welfare of aquatic animals and aquariums in zoos globally. As such, they offer a free aquatic animal welfare module focused on fish and aquatic invertebrates. Uh, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance Academy offers an animal welfare series on the basics of animal welfare as a science, including its definition, some of the history of animal welfare law, and the significant differences between animal welfare and animal rights. At the foundation of Merck, uh, Merck's Aquacare 365 is an uh, uh, is aquaculture farm employee training uh, to ensure that everyone working uh, with fish has an understanding of normal fish behavior and can handle and treat fish with the best quality care. So I put this slide up here with the links because these are free trainings that anybody can access. Um, and so I definitely um, admire these organizations for, for putting these together for, for public use and implementation. Okay, so <clears throat> before you dive in, realize you're making a sacrifice with your available free time, and it should be known that there is no guarantee that you will be successful. And guaranteeing success, well, that's another thing. Is it making money? Is it cracking a new species? Is it displacing fish that would otherwise be wild caught? Um, or is it simply the joy of having cute little baby fish uh, to admire in your fish room? It's important to reel in your goals and figure out what success looks like to you and what those milestones are. Your family also needs to be supportive because you're going to be in the garage a lot. Um, your utility bills, they're gonna go up. Of course, electricity, um, water a little bit. Um, when you head out of town, you're gonna need to hire or find someone to help take care of your fish while things, uh, because things are gonna go wrong occasionally and you just have to, you have to be prepared for that. We're lucky, uh, you know, that Mick's a, a professor at the college and she's trained a whole bunch of local students and one of which lives right across the, the island from us, so she's probably there feeding the fish right now. We appreciate Sarah if you're out there. Um, and so you, you definitely need to keep in mind, you need to have a, a friend or a buddy who can help you out when, when you try to go on vacation or try to drive to Macna. Um, 
Here's a, a photo of our refugium. This is just a, a you know, little bit of eye candy. Um, I built this tank out of acrylic. It's free spanning, uh, so it, has, it sits on nothing. It's actually bolted to the, to the bay window walls. Um, it's part of a recirculating system that is uh, in combination with a, a reef tank and a frag tank. It's in our dining room, and it's just one of a uh, multitude of aquariums that are taking over our entire house and garage. Um, so with that, uh, you know, we're happy that you all uh, came here to, to listen to our talk after we thought we weren't even going to make it here. So we appreciate you. Um, and we got just a little bit of time for questions if you all have any. Thank you. Thanks.